Thank you so much for joining. Um, I would like to welcome everyone. Greetings, my name is Kathleen Steele and I will be moderating this session. Today I'd like to start out this webinar with a quote. Community is a beautiful thing that sometimes even heals us and makes us better than we would otherwise be. Again, thank you for being part of our wellness community, and we realize that despite your busy schedule, you've opted to join us and participate in this webinar to help yourself, your family, and your community live happier and healthier lives. Last webinar, we discussed the leaky gut, intestinal permeability, and the root cause of chronic diseases. If you missed it, you can catch it on YouTube, and if you would also like to check out, we have some other videos on there, you can go ahead and subscribe for past and future videos. Today I'd like to go over a few rules. We please ask that you please remain on mute and that any question that you have ask in the question and answer section so that way we're able to answer as many as possible. I'd like to further ado introduce Dr. Nadia Ali. She is the founder of Functional Integrative Medicine Practice functional holistic healing. She's been practicing for 16 years. She's board certified in internal medicine specialty. She is board certified in integrative medicine. She's a fellow of the American College of Physicians and a member of the Institute of Functional Medicine. She has certifications in, other, in many other areas. And if you'd like to learn more about her practice and her other certifications, you can check out her at www.boholistichealing.com. Org. And today we have our guest, Dr. Mary Jo Mazzaro. Um, she graduated from Temple um, with a bachelor's in biology, and she earned her um, dentistry, her doctorate in medical dentistry from Temple University. She completed her general practice residency in 2010 from Christiana Care Hospital. She's a member of the International Academy of Biological Dentistry and Medicine and the International Academy of Oral and Medicine Toxicology. Toxology, sorry about that. And she became SMART certified in 2018 and opened her, her own dental practice in 2019 in Westchester, Pennsylvania. You can learn more about her practice at www.massero md.com. So today's topic, we will be discussing mercury, the cause of chronic disease. So I would like to go ahead and start with our first question. So we learned in our last webinar that Toxins play a very important role in causing leaky gut. Dr. Ali, why did you choose to discuss mercury toxicity? Well, the most important reason why uh, we thought that mercury would be the first toxin we wanted to discuss was that uh, WHO, World Health Organization, considers mercury as one of the top 10 dangerous chemicals affecting human health. The other important reason is, as opposed to a lot of toxins where there's a threshold that you have to reach before that chemical actually becomes toxic, for mercury, even small amounts of exposure is enough to cause serious health problems. It's a problem for, for a fetus, it's a problem for infants, it's a problem for children. So it affects almost every age group. It's considered a global pollutant. And it's one of the causes of disease that is often missed, um, especially with the degree of toxicity it has and of the prevalence. So if you look at the exposure of mercury, we find that mercury is almost everywhere. There are multiple ways that we are being exposed. We actually ingest mercury. Uh, we ingest it through foods like fish and shellfish, dairy, chicken, eggs, processed food like high fructose corn syrup, red meat, especially beef and pork are important sources of mercury. We can inhale mercury from certain sources. We actually can be exposed through our skin. 
And unfortunately, it's also present in products like vaccine, uh, which is actually mandatory in multiple states for our children. So if you look at how we are being exposed, we find that mercury is an antiques. Uh, these were the items that were made many years ago, and they, at that time we were not aware of the toxicity of mercury. It's present in appliances like dryers, iron, washing machines. It's present in automotive parts. We still have mercury in barometers that we have in our home. Certain batteries contain mercury. And it's important to know this because when we are, when we are in the process of getting rid of these items, we actually trash them without having an idea that what are we doing? Because when we do that, we're actually recirculating mercury back in the environment, back in the water, back in our fields. We have electronic items which contain mercury like LCD screens. A certain jewelry that comes from Mexico actually contains mercury. Dental amalgams are a very important source of mercury, and we have 103,000 dental offices across the United States which are putting in mercury fillings or removing mercury fillings, and these contribute to 5.1 tons of mercury each year that we put in our environment. And one of the very important reasons why, even though we have been putting these fillings for a very long period of time, now our exposure has increased from these fillings is the use of cell phones or devices which release electromagnetic fields like MRIs. Because when you have mercury inside your mouth and you're using a cell phone or you're using a device, that device significantly increases the release of mercury from these fillings. And so we are being exposed to it much more than we were before. We also have mercury in the light bulbs. We actually have mercury in prescription medications like antibiotics, water pills, nasal sprays, eye drops, hemorrhoid creams. We have mercury in medical equipment. We still have thermometers which are made with mercury. We still have blood pressure measuring machines which contain mercury. Um, a lot of creams which are for skin lightening purposes still contain mercury. So when you are using a product, it doesn't matter whether it's a product for your home or for your cleaning or for your face, one of the key things is to actually look at the ingredients and to know what are you doing? What are you exposing yourself to? We have mercury in sporting equipment and thermostats. So being such a highly toxic uh, element, it's very important that we are aware of how we are exposing it because the most important strategy is prevention. You know, once you are exposed, the process of getting rid of mercury can become very difficult. But if you can prevent the exposure, Nothing could be better than that. And the whole uh, purpose of this webinar is to create the awareness that this is something we can do, we can prevent, as long as we understand how we are being exposed. As Dr. Ali mentioned, we still have dentists putting silver in, and mercury fillings in. Dr. Macero, tell us about your journey from putting mercury fillings in to removing mercury fillings. So um, I grew up in a local area where my dentist put amalgam fillings in my mouth. Uh, I then went on to learn in dental school how to place amalgam fillings. And it was a core concept in my dental education, how to place these fillings. We had to learn uh, the proper preparation type to hold the amalgam filling in. We had multiple hands-on exams, uh, working with the material. And the justification um, of using this material um, in school was that they are harder than the tooth colored fillings. They supposedly last longer and they can be placed in the presence of saliva or blood. And that's important when you're making a clinical decision, you know, if the mouth is a wet environment, if you have to place a filling, if you can't get the saliva or the blood to stop, then you have to, you know, you can't put in a white color filling, a bonded filling. Um, so these fillings, these amalgams, they're definitely not tooth colored, 
um, but dental school told us that they were safe to safe as long as they were set. So they took about 24 hours to set up after you place them, but after that they were supposed to be inert or they weren't supposed to do anything except be there. They were set, meaning that they didn't leak or leach any material out. So after I graduated, I started my residency. I got a job at an office that was still placing amalgam fillings. Um, I was placing and removing amalgam fillings regularly. Um, it was my experience at that point that since my dental school and um, my colleagues and in general, the nation, you know, you have nationwide dentists placing amalgams, that this material was safe to use. Um, I assume that the FDA and the ADA and anyone else who endorses the use of this material um, had done the research to prove that it was safe enough. So um, I'm here talking about it now because I learned a hard lesson about that. That's not exactly true. Um, so about six years into my practice, um, I suddenly got very ill and my health started to fail me. And I was a healthy, robust person. I would never say, I would never usually catch a cold even. Um, but a few years back um, in October, I started feeling ill. I had uh, chills, fever, I had heavy coughing. I couldn't shake this cold. It took about two weeks for that to resolve, even though it didn't completely resolve, it was away enough that I felt better. Um, and then I went back to work, I was at work, and all of a sudden I felt like I, my face went numb, uh, Bell's palsy they call it, when you're, the muscles in your face will, will stop working and the numbness that travels down, will, it radiated down my shoulder and into my arm and everything kind of fell. So I went immediately to the emergency room where they admitted me. They thought I was having a heart attack or a stroke. Um, and I was young. I was 33 years old at that time. And so by a month later, um, I started having these intense migraines. I had diarrhea. I had lightheadedness. I had visual disturbances, dizziness, overall feelings of dread. Um, I've never had anxiety in my life. And all of a sudden, I was having panic attacks. Loud sounds would bother me. I couldn't regulate my body temperature. I felt weak and fatigued all of the time. Food bothered me. Um, I developed all sorts of GI symptoms. I had reflux and gastritis and diarrhea. Um, I went from a happy, healthy person to um, almost like an invalid in a couple months. I lost 10 pounds on my already small frame. So it was, I was very scared. I didn't know what was going on and no one could figure out what was going wrong with me. Um, so during my hospital stay, I visited with cardiologists and internists. I had MRIs, I had CTs, I had blood work, I had echocardiograms, physical examinations, and nothing showed to be abnormal. Um, and then after discharge, I saw my primary care doctor, a neurologist, a GI doctor, an ENT, an optometrist, a cardiologist, a few ER doctors, and no one could figure anything wrong with me. I had um, en endoscopies where they actually stick tubes down your throat and take samples of your stomach. Um, all good. No one could find anything wrong with me. Um, one of the neurologists that I saw told me I had, um, it was a migraine condition and he wanted me to take any seizure medication for the rest of my life. Um, and basically any doctor I went to couldn't diagnose me with a, anything, but they offered me some kind of prescription medication to see if it helped. Of course, none of them did. Um, and by the time I was properly diagnosed, it was almost a year later. My exposure, I believe, came from the fillings that I had in my mouth, um, my diet, which was a lot of seafood, and um, sitting over people as a dentist drilling out amalgam fillings so that you get a lot of exposure that way. Um, I was breathing in all that vaporized mercury. And I, and I realized when I finally got diagnosed that I needed to change the way that I practice or I need to quit my dental career. Um, so I didn't quit. <laughs> I had my fillings removed by a biologic dentist and I stopped eating tuna. So I revamped my diet. Um, I got more involved with biologic dentistry. Um, I got SMART certified, which means that I can remove amalgam fillings safely for me, for my staff, and importantly, the patient. Um, 
and biologic dentists, when I became more involved with them, I realized that most, if not all of them, do biologic dentistry because they became sick themselves. So it was, it felt good for me to know that I wasn't alone in this. Um, they scrutinize materials and dental, you know, and methods, the way you do things, they look for more holistic and biocompatible alternatives to fix the problem. Um, so like I said, I became smart certified in 2018 and I opened my own practice in 2019. So this allows me to practice the way that I want to. And there's a video I just want to show everyone um, uh, about what is going on in your mouth if you have an amalgam filling. So this is a special screen under a UV light. This tooth that this gentleman is holding was extracted. It's about 25 years old. It's got a, it's got a big amalgam filling in it. And things that you can do to that amalgam filling. You can put a temperature uh, stimulus on it, a thermal stimulus, and it, you can see, you can actually see the vapor. Um, you can rub the filling, which would be just like chewing or grinding your teeth, and you can see how much vapor is coming off. These fillings are not inert. They are gassing off all the time. The mouth is a wet environment and a lot of stuff goes on and these fillings are leaking. They are leaking. So I thought this was a very powerful video. Without the smoke screen, you can't see um, anything in real life. The, this gas, this vapor is odorless, tasteless. You can't see it with the naked eye. So you need all this, uh, you know, the, the UV light and that special screen to even see what's going on. Dr. Macero mentioned a safe removal protocol that needs to have input from a functional physician. Why is there a need for, for consulting with a functional physician? So basically, um, the reason why we are involved in SMART protocols is that even though when you are doing the SMART protocol, uh, you are making uh, sure that mercury does not get into the system. But uh, what happens is there's no procedure that's, uh, you can call it foolproof. There is still, despite all the precautions that are being took, that are being taken, there is a possibility that a small amount of mercury may still get into the system. So for that reason, what you need is you need a functional physician who's going to make sure that before that procedure is undertaken, you actually have supplements, nutrients, and antioxidants on board that are able to take care of the small exposure that gets into your system uh, and that you're able to get rid of it. So um, uh, when Dr. Macero, as she was talking about her own story, you know, when she got her fillings removed, we were working together to make sure that her process is a smooth process where she can not only work before and after her procedure to get rid of the fillings, even with a biologic dentist, but she is on the right stuff. And then post doing that, we are able to get rid of whatever was there, which obviously had been stored in her body. So that is the role of the functional physician before, during, and post the process of removal. For someone who has a cavity, what other materials can be used to fill those cavities? And are there any other issues associated with those materials? What is the safe way to fill cavities? Um, actually, uh, Kathy, uh, Kathy, what I would do is before that, we should talk about uh, what is a SMART protocol and we should talk about what is the role of mercury in terms of causing organ damage. And that is important to understand because if we can understand that, then we would understand why is it so important to get rid of amalgam fillings. So if we look at this slide, what we see here is the role of mercury toxicity. If you see that mercury is affecting almost every single system in the body, uh, and one of the most important system it affects is the neurological system. And if you remember the story that Dr. M uh, Mary Jumacero had talked about, she had talked about neurological symptoms that she started off with. 
because most of the mercury is stored in the neurons. Uh, there is also, you can see, uh, an impact on the immune system. And we now know that autoimmune diseases can actually happen as a direct consequence of exposure to mercury. There is also insulin resistance, diabetes and metabolic syndrome that can happen as a result of mercury. Last time we had talked about the role of toxins in leaky gut. And we know that mercury plays a very important role in causing leaky gut. There is also an impact of mercury on skin uh, diseases uh, as well as eye diseases. Mercury can cause kidney disease as well because that is how mercury is excreted. It can cause lung disease. It plays a very important role in heart disease. And it is also implicated in obesity and fatty liver disease. I'm going to give you some idea about how these systems are affected. So the first system we talked about is the nervous system. So of course, uh, people who are exposed to mercury will have anxiety, they will have irritability, mood changes. They will have a lot of nerve symptoms like numbness, tingling, they will have memory issues. They actually will present with tremors. We've actually seen people presenting with Parkinson's disease-like symptoms secondary to mercury. These people also have muscle weakness, difficulty with balance, they have vision issues, hearing issues, um, issues with uh, speech. They will often um, talk about uh, having difficulty finding words um, or sometimes stuttering. Uh, they also have difficulty with walking or standing straight. They also have issues with brain fog, uh, memory problems, concentration problems. And there are a number of diseases that are implicated, uh, such as ADHD, um, MS can happen secondary to mercury exposure. We, I already talked about Parkinson's disease. And we have seen people with Alzheimer's disease uh, secondary to mercury exposure. Uh, if you talk about the autoimmune diseases, this is a very interesting study which was done where they had about 1,352 women between the age of 16 and 49. And they found that um, the higher the level of mercury in blood in these women, the higher was the chance that they are going to have a marker which is called ANA, which is anti-nuclear antibodies. Now, anti-nuclear antibody is a marker for multiple autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, systemic sclerosis. Very importantly, uh, we also know that uh, uh, one of the most common autoimmune diseases is hypothyroidism. And we know that another study which was done on about 4,409 adults between the years of 2007 and 8 showed that the level of mercury in the blood directly correlated with the thyroid hormones T3 and T4. So the higher the level of mercury, the lower T3 and T4. This is one of the reasons why uh, in Europe, mercury fillings are banned amongst women of childbearing age, children, and adolescents. Um, moving on, we talked about mercury and its impact on the GI system or digestive system. People exposed to it could get nausea, vomiting, metallic taste in mouth. They could actually present with diarrhea because they have inflammation of the colon or colitis. Exposure to mercury directly affects the gut bacteria. Uh, we also know that uh, mercury is implicated in insulin resistance and diabetes. Uh, there was a study recently published in 2019 where they looked at 1,442 mother-child pairs. Uh, and they followed these pairs from birth to 15 years. And what they found was that an elevated exposure to mercury um, during the time the child was in the womb of the mother was associated with higher risk of overweight and obesity in childhood. There was another study which was done in Korea uh, in 2018 where they looked at 1,567 adolescents and they found that the level of exposure to mercury directly was associated with abdominal obesity. We also know that people who are exposed to mercury have higher liver function tests like ALT, AST, and in particular GGT, which is a marker of toxicity 
secondary to uh, mercury exposure to the liver. We also know that mercury has been implicated in fatty liver disease. Um, mercury exposure can lead to major consequences when it comes to heart health. Uh, these individuals will have high blood pressure. They will have blockages at multiple points. So you could have a block in the vessel of your heart causing heart attack. And if you remember the story of Dr. Mary Jamacero, she had mentioned how there was an initial impression that she might have a heart attack or that she had stroke. And so mercury exposure can mimic as a stroke because you could have a blockage of the vessels in your brain and that can cause stroke-like symptoms. You could have abnormal rhythm of the heart. You could have carotid artery obstruction uh, and you could have actually obstruction of multiple blood vessels in your body. Uh, the reason is because mercury causes inflammation of the blood vessels and wherever you're going to have inflammation, you're going to have blockage you will have formation of the plaque. Uh, and there was actually an NIH study which was done on chelation in people who have already had a heart attack and they actually found it beneficial uh, in uh, a particular group of people with heart attack. Uh, mercury also causes lung damage. So if you inhale mercury, then you can have uh, inflammation of the lung, which we call it interstitial pneumonia. We also find that these individuals have inflammation of airways and lungs, and they have destruction of the alveoli, which are the sacs in the lung, leading to a condition called emphysema. So some of you may remember that when we are exposed to um, cigarette smoking, we develop COPD. A type of COPD is called emphysema. We now know that mercury exposure inhalation can also cause a picture similar to the exposure from smoking, which is emphysema. So the initial stages is the inflammation. And after the inflammation, there's scarring of the lung. And so these individuals will go on to develop interstitial fibrosis or scarring of the lung tissue. Um, now, when you expose yourself to mercury, the mercury will get into the body, the liver will try to detox it and then will try to get it through the kidneys. When mercury reaches the kidneys, it actually causes damage to the kidney tubules. And you can see here that these tubules, actually there are holes in these tubules. The result is that the urine will start leaking protein. So these individuals will get in what is called chronic kidney disease because they are damaging their tubules. Uh, we also know that when children are exposed to mercury, they get something called the pink disease, where they get pink and dusky discoloration of the tips of their hands and feet. They will have pain there. They can also get itching. They can have skin peeling there. If you see this picture, it's very evident. These are mouth sores, which are right at the point where the filling is placed. So there is a possibility of actually inflammation of this area. You will also find some of these individuals will develop gingivitis or inflammation of the gingiva. Uh, they will have issues with their teeth. Uh, there could be nail loss and they could also be eczema due to exposure to the skin. Uh, last but not least, mercury actually affects vision and it can cause loss of vision and it can also cause loss of color vision. It actually impacts every single part of the eye. So there is loss of sensation of the cornea, which is right this area. It causes destruction of the iris, which is, which is right here. Uh, it can cause damage to the optic nerve, which is here. It can cause damage to the retina, which is basically where we project the image. It can cause damage to the choroid vessels. And so you can find a lot of damage almost every single area of the eye. So in all in all, almost every single part of the body is actually affected by mercury exposure. Thank you so much for, for that, Dr. Ali, for discussing the safety removal and the SMART protocol a little bit. Um, Dr. Macero, for someone who has a cavity, what other materials 
could we use to fill those cavities? So what is the safe way to fill cavities? So um, in terms of replacement filling, um, you can have a composite or a bonded filling or a white tooth filling, it's not commonly known as. Um, and there's many brands out there. Most of these products claim to be um, BPA free, which um, if you're not familiar with BPA is um, a hormone disruptor. Um, but even though they're BPA free, they contain an ingredient that breaks down to BPA. So it's really not as clean as they're advertising. Um, there's only well, one or the most, um, um, the favorite material for biologic dentists, at least in the US, is a German brand um, called Boco, and the material is called Admira Fusion. And that is um, truly BPA free and any derivative free. So you're not gonna get any kind of chemical breakdown or hormone disruption from that material. Um, Another way, depending on how large the cavity is that the amalgam was sitting in, um, you could have it replaced with an inlay, an onlay, or a crown. Um, depending on how big the, that amalgam was, amalgams are so hard, they're like little rocks and teeth. And when, you know, years and years of biting and biting on that tooth, on that filling, you're going to create little micro fractures in the tooth. So the tooth is weakened over time when you have that filling in. So a crown might be the best way to go. Um, and they're typically made from porcelain. You want to make sure that the crown or the inlay only doesn't contain any metal um, because porcelain is bio biocompatible with the body. You don't want any metal in your mouth. Um, metal corrodes because the mouth is a wet environment. So whatever the replacement will be, you just want to make sure that's metal free. Um, um, more holistic dentists will use other adjuvants when they uh, remove an amalgam filling like ozone gas or lasers, um, uh, bioceramics or another um, adjuvant that can help the teeth actually promote healing of the tooth structure. Um, but at the end, you start, you're still going to have the filling or the onlay or inlay or crown on top of all that. So um, there's lots of ways to help heal the tooth after you have that amalgam filling removed. Um, the safest way to treat cavities is to, to do the least harm to the tooth while still taking care of the problem. So there's many ways to uh, do this. It really depends on who you ask. Every dentist or biologic dentist, I should say, will have, may have a different opinion. But um, the bottom line is it's a philosophy. You just want to do the least harm to the tooth and to the patient. Dr. Mistero, you might want to talk a little bit about the SMART protocol, uh, which I think is one of the keys when it comes to removal of amalgam fillings in terms of what does it look like to do the SMART protocol, how is it carried out, and how is it different from, uh, you know, actually just uh, removing it like, you know, conventional physicians or conventional dentists often just remove an amalgam filling. And... Uh, why is it not necessarily safe? And what would be a safe protocol or what we call the SMART protocol? So conventional dentists, the way that even I used to remove an amalgam filling would just be to um, basically drill on the filling to remove it. And when you do that, when you hit um, an amalgam with a high speed burr um, with a handpiece, you create a ton of vapor, of mercury vapor that not only, you know, and, and you can see the silver, the, the filling is just vaporizing and turning into sludge right in front of you when you hit it with the drill. So the patient is ingesting it, everyone's breathing it in. Um, you, you rinse away a lot of it, but there's a whole lot that uh, the patient comes in contact with. So what we do now is the SMART protocol. Um, patients will come in and I, ideally they've been seen by a functional medicine practitioner. So they're detox pathways are open and they're ready to have this procedure done. Um, but you, we pre-rinse them with some charcoal or some other biologic dentist use another absorbent. Um, we give them an alternate air source to breathe. So it's, um, you know, the nose is covered and they're breathing some clean air, not anything that's going to be close to their, you know, the mouth is close to the nose. So any vapor that gets uh, escapes, they're not breathing it in through their nose. They have a dental dam on their tooth, which um, if, no one's familiar with that. I tried to include a picture there um, with a gentleman having that dam over his tooth on the bottom. There is suction underneath 
the dam in the mouth. There is the suction device on top of the tooth, and then there is an extra oral suction device outside the mouth, which is that long white hose that you can see in some of those pictures. Um, and then in addition to that, the staff should be fully covered. They have proper, you know, they're covered head to toe with special masks and head caps and gowns. And um, you don't want to allow any of that mercury vapor or particles to touch your skin, me as a practitioner or the patient. And when you are actually cutting the amalgam up, you want to do that differently than let's say a conventional dentist may do it. You want to make sure that you cut out large chunks of the filling so you actually drill on less of the filling at once. And that helps to significantly reduce the amount of mercury exposure. BPA was mentioned as a hormone disruptor earlier. Um, and I just wanted to mention that we will be discussing this topic um, in the hormone imbalance next uh, during our next functional webinar. Um, so I just want to take the time to mention that. Dr. Ali, um, can pregnant women with high exposure to mercury pass the toxicity to her babies? Definitely, no question about it. So we know that mercury exposure directly impacts the fetus in multiple ways. Most importantly, it's the neurological system that gets affected. Fetal brain development is going to be affected, which means that these children will have low IQs and they will have a problem with their cognitive development or uh, what we call it, the ability to solve problems. Um, they, there is a risk of cerebral palsy. There's also a problem with regards to the development of their speech. Uh, and they can also get in trouble with mood disorders. Um, one of the recent studies that was done, which I thought was very interesting, was carried out by EPA. EPA is the Environmental Protection Agency. They actually looked at babies that were born between August and September 2004. And what they did was they took the cord blood. So remember that this baby is just coming out into the world. And so whatever is going to be in the blood of this baby is basically what is also in the blood of the mother. They analyzed that blood, the cord blood, and they found 287 chemicals with an average of 200 chemicals in each sample. And that I think is very scary. Of those chemicals, 180 actually were cancer causing chemicals. 217 chemicals were toxic to the brain and nervous system. And 208 actually can cause birth or developmental defects. So you can imagine that the type of toxicity that we are talking about is not simply one mercury or just arsenic or just cadmium. We are talking about a whole bunch of chemicals that we are exposing ourselves to beginning from the time that we are in the womb. And so you can imagine that when we ask the question, why is the rate of autism going up? Why is the rate of autoimmunity going up? Why is the rate of cancer going up in people who actually have no risk factors? So if we remember, we say, well, cigarette smoking is a risk factor. Alcohol is a risk factor. More and more people that we see who have these diseases do not have those risk factors. But it's not surprising because our exposure to toxins is going up significantly. Uh, and so the other question is that is the transmission of toxin, is it single generation or multi-generation? And so if you look at exposure to mercury, we know that when a baby is exposed to mercury, there are changes, what we call epigenetic changes. What does that mean? It means that mercury actually triggers certain genes. It turns them on and it turns off certain genes. Now, if the epigenetic changes take place in the regular cells of the body, the change will be from the mother to the baby and no longer after that, meaning the baby will not transmit that change to the next baby that is going to be coming from this baby. But if that change happens in the sperm or the ovary of that baby in the womb, then that change will continue for generation. So we're talking about multi-generational inheritance. 
and we cannot predict when that change will happen in a regular cell or when it's going to happen in a sperm or an ovary. So not only are we talking about a single generation, we're talking about multi-generational change. Many, many, many generations will have to suffer from the initial exposure that happened at one time. So clearly it's very important that when a woman is planning to be pregnant, that is the time to ask the question, have I been exposed? If you have fillings, if you have been exposed, you need to take care of it before you get pregnant. Because once you get pregnant, we cannot do anything. We cannot do chelation. We cannot ask you to go and get your amalgam fillings out. Because as Dr. Masar has already mentioned, that even after all of the precautions, there's still a possibility of exposure. And that's not the time to meddle with you know, issues of toxicity. You deal with the issues of toxicity before you get into the pregnancy mode because that is when your transmission is going to begin for your baby and that is the key that women should know that they need to take care of. Dr. Macero, what questions does a patient need to ask their dentist before getting their mercury fillings removed? Um, you should be able to talk to your dentist. I mean, tell your dentist you're concerned about the mercury in your filling. It, um, it's very important that you talk to them, pay attention to their attitude on how they respond to you. Um, ask what they will do to protect you from the mercury exposure that will happen during the removal process. Um, ask what material will take the amalgam's place. Um, some dentists may be very open-minded to hear about it. Maybe they've already heard it from other patients. Maybe they have their own protocol in the office um, that they just don't advertise unless you're going to have a filling removed. Um, but don't be afraid to ask is the bottom line. Um, and if the dentist is not open to changing the materials that they used, you can at least ask for the safety data sheet. They call it the SDS. Um, then you will be able to make an informed decision for yourself. But bottom line, just talk to your dentist. Dr. Ali, are there tests to look for mercury inside the body um, that assesses the body's burden? Definitely. So um, remember that mercury, when it gets into the body, it gets stored in multiple organs and there are multiple tests that we can do. There's one test we call the porphyrin test. It's the test we do on the urine to assess uh, the degree of exposure. The second test that we do is what we call red blood cell analysis, where we look at the mercury inside the red cell. What is the amount of mercury inside the red cell? There are some physicians who do what is, what is called the provocation testing. The provocation testing is basically you give a couple of pills to the patient before you do the urine test. And the purpose is that you're trying to get mercury from different organs to get into the bloodstream and then you see what happens when it comes out of the urine. We do not do that because provocation tests can have adverse consequences. It's particularly true for people whose kidneys are not working. So if you try to get the mercury out and then it gets into the kidney, but you already have a compromised kidney, you will actually exacerbate the damage. If you have a gut issue, then you will also exacerbate the damage because the body cannot get rid of the excess mercury that you are trying to bring out of the organ. The result will be you will go from one organ and you place the mercury in another organ, which will be creating more damage than good. Um, so here is a test, uh, which is, we were talking about the urine test, the porphyrin test. Here is a patient. This test was done on September 4th, 2018. And you can see that she has elevated uroporphyrin, heptaporphyrin, but more importantly, she has elevated pre-corporoporphyrin. This is the one porphyrin, which is extremely important and extremely specific for mercury. And you can see this is supposed to be less than 7.5 and she has 21.9. Um, and if you, this is her post test and this was done on November 5th, 2019. And you can see that she has made a lot of progress and a lot of her porphyrins are down. In particular, if you look at her pre corporal porphyrin, it's really in the green. She needs to work a little bit still on her corporal one and three, but she has made significant progress. Um, and so, yes, you can, the, the process is very objective. You can see what happens 
in the beginning, you can look at your levels before, and then you can make the changes that you need to make with regards to removing the filling and changing your diet and doing the process of chelation, and you will find that you can actually make a dent to it. Apart from the removal of mercury fillings, what can be done to reduce mercury exposures, food sources, vaccination sources, occupational sources? Um, so mercury is found now in most parts of the ocean. It's in pesticides. Um, anytime you don't buy organic food, you run the risk of consuming mercury in your fruits, your vegetables, your meats, your wines, your seafood which is unfortunate. Um, vaccines contain mercury still. Of course, we talked about mercury at the dental office. Um, and really, you, you really risk mercury exposure going into a dental office, even if you're not there to have a filling removed, because if the dentist isn't using proper precautions, let's say someone next door to the um, dental chair that you're sitting in is having their fillings removed. Well, that mercury vapor is just pluming all over the office and it gets stuck in popcorn ceilings, in um, the drop ceilings, it gets stuck in rugs, it gets stuck in fabric and it just, you know, it's sitting in the air. So the dentist office can be a very toxic place to visit. Um, so it's important that you, you know, are aware of that. Um, Dr. Ali, in addition to reducing the exposure of mercury and removing the mercury fillings, how can we reduce the, mer the burden of mercury in the body? So, um, you know, the process of removing the total body load of mercury, uh, because we know that even if you remove the filling, it cannot take care of what has already gotten inside your body, is called chelation. Remember that chelation is a very heavy duty process, which means that it's a process which requires a lot of energy, it requires a lot of nutrients, it requires a lot of antioxidants. Uh, so when we are working on chelation, we have to make sure that before you undertake the process of chelation, which is simply that you get mercury out of the different organs, you have a binder which binds with mercury and then takes it out of the body. Before you do that, you want to make sure that there are adequate nutrients, you want to make sure there are adequate antioxidants. You want to make sure that your liver is optimized because remember liver is the organ of detox. You also want to make sure your kidneys are optimized. You also want to make sure your lymphatics are working because remember the lymphatics actually bring the mercury from all the different organs and try to get it out of the body. You want to have optimal mitochondrial function because mitochondria are the small little structures inside the cell which provide the energy. And chelation requires a lot of energy. You also want to make sure that you have gut optimization because gut is another place from where mercury gets out of the body. Uh, and last but not least, you can actually use the skin uh, as a way of getting rid of mercury. So we actually have um, infrared therapy, hypothermic infrared therapy in our office, which we use as a tool which can allow release of mercury through the skin because of the presence of infrared and high heat. So you want to make sure that all these systems are optimized before you undertake the process of chelation. We see a lot of people who come to our office and they say we are doing chelation for years without doing any testing. So chelation is not a lifelong process. Chelation is a process which has a beginning and it has an end. And there are midpoints, which means when you start chelation, you tell the patient I'm doing chelation, this is your baseline numbers. Then over the course of three months, six months, you repeat the test and you make sure that the burden is coming down. And then there's a point where you end the chelation because that's a time when you have been able to achieve your goal and every number is in the right place. And at that point, you stop the chelation. So chelation is not lifelong. It's a specific process that's undertaken. And a lot of things have to be in place in the right place and be optimized before you can start the process of chelation. And so if you do it properly and you don't go too fast with it, you will actually be able to achieve your result of making the patient improve the symptoms, prevent complications from mercury, and then make sure that you sustain that progress over a long period of time. So that, go that concludes our... Um our 
topic um, for prepared questions. So I'd like to, before we start in our question and answer section, I'd like to introduce um, next week's, um, or sorry about that, August 15th, Saturday, August 15th, 2020, 4 p.m., a functional approach to hormone imbalance. Again, that's August 15th, Saturday. Registration is required and seats are limited. And the objectives are going to be how an imbalance of estrogen and progesterone leads to PMS, um, insulin resistance, fibroids, PCOS, hot flashes, and vaginal dryness, how hormone balance affected by cortisol and the thyroid hormone, what is the link between leaky gut and hormone imbalance, how inflammation affects estrogen and progesterone, and how to balance estrogen and progesterone. So I'm gonna go ahead and look at some of the questions. Dr. Macero, how are you handling the safety of your dental services during COVID-19 pandemic? Um, so we have, um, we, we screen all the patients. We are open. We're just seeing less patients in the office and the patients that do come in, we're screening them to make sure that they aren't sick, to make sure that they haven't been around anyone that's sick. Um, they will arrive in the parking lot and call us when they're there. So we will call them back when we're ready to see them. They come up to the door, we'll take their temperature outside. They come in, they um, go right back to the operatories and we have them rinse with a peroxide rinse. And the peroxide rinse is because um, they've, it's been proven to kill COVID on contact in the mouth and in the throat area. So if you can gargle with the peroxide, that's gonna help um, before you sit down, before we do any work on you, create any aerosols. Um, we use that extra oral suction that you saw for the SMART protocol because that collects any um, aerosols that are coming off of the, the drilling that we're doing if we have to drill. Um, my staff and I have all the extra PPE, the extra precautions. We have masks and shields on top of the already um, our regular protective gear. Um, my staff um, is awesome at cleaning up. I mean, they basically follow you around and wipe down any surfaces anybody touches. So they're really on top of it. Um, and um, we've invested in air scrubbers too. So that's another thing to help the quality of the air in the dental office in addition to our SMART protocol. Um, they're called surgically clean air units. And what it does is it just takes the ambient air and it pulls it in and it pulls it through a carbon filter, a HEPA filter, a UV light, which kills germs and then it re-energizes the air with negative ions before it shoots it back out. So it's actually giving you energized air. And it's, um, it's costly, but I think it's a wonderful addition. Um, I think it's the right thing to do in the dental office. What are, the, um, what are some pros and cons of implants? Dental implants are a wonderful way to restore a tooth that is lost, a functional tooth that's been lost. Um, it's, there are titanium implants and there are ceramic implants. Um, I would probably choose to put a ceramic one in my mouth if I had to have one because ceramic is that porcelain that we talked about before and it's more biocompatible. Um, whereas titanium is metal and some people can be sensitive to the metal, develop allergies from the metal, um, so while they're both very strong and ceramic implants are newer to the U.S., they've been around in Germany and Europe for years, but they're newer to the U.S., so I would probably opt for a ceramic one. Um, and pros and cons of implants, some implants, some people uh, do wonderfully with them. They can last the rest of your life. You don't always need an implant, so this is where you need to collaborate with your dentist because depending on where in the mouth you lost a tooth, um, you may be just fine without it, as long as you don't have bite changes and you can chew your food properly. Digestion is so important and you want to be able to chew the food and make it small enough so that your stomach can you know, digest it. Um, so that's something where you'd have to, like I said, collaborate with your dentist on if you need a replacement or not. So it's conditional, but implants are a wonderful option. 
we have a question about um, gold implant and what your thoughts are about gold implants. So they don't have the actual implant that's gold. They have the abutment that is gold. Um, and it, it is metal. Um, they use gold abutments when, um, like in an aesthetic area, because if you use a titanium abutment, it's a silver color. And um, the show through of the gum will, will have a, a gray shadow. They're both metal, um, but the gold um, is a warmer hue and doesn't show uh, darker around the gingiva where the restoration is. So it is still a metal. Um, it should be, it's not covered completely by the crown, um, but as long as you're not sensitive to the gold, if there's no gingival inflammation, there's no pus, um, if you're not having other, any other health issues, a gold abutment should be okay. Um, I would just comment that again, gold is a metal and I think we have had uh, patients who have had issues. We have had, um, we have had some data that there was a time gold was actually used for uh, treating certain diseases as well. But later on, we found that it actually has some adverse effects, particularly with regards to the kidney. And so in my opinion, the best thing would be to stay away from metals. So I think like Dr. Nsero said that I would probably go with the ceramic implant. That is a better option. We know that it's quite an inert element, which means that it is not going to do a, it's not going to do any harm. So I would definitely stay away from metals. So that's another thing to bring in your professional doctor because as a dentist, I'm not testing your kidney function. Correct. I'm looking at the gum tissue and things in the mouth, so it's a, it's a collaboration. Agreed, completely agreed. Um, so that actually kind of goes good to this next question is, how does the chelation process not also deplete the patient's other important metal ions of similar valence like copper, zinc, et cetera? So that's an excellent question. And that is precisely why I said that it's not a process that you can just undertake, like you just put somebody on a chelation process without having any idea of what their nutritional status is. So one of the key things is that you have to make sure that their nutritional status is amazingly good, which means it's optimized. The second thing you will do is when you chelate, you actually put them on certain minerals because you know that you will be, when you try to put in an agent to chelate, or bind a particular metal, for example, mercury, it doesn't mean it's not going to bind other metals. It's not going to bind zinc. It's not going to bind uh, copper. And so you have to keep an eye on that. That's precisely why I said that you have to make sure that you, that person is on certain nutrients, that person is on certain antioxidants, and that periodically when you are checking them, you are also checking for those nutrients because you don't want that person to continue chelation if they don't have adequate zinc, because if you don't have zinc, you cannot detox. If you don't have selenium, you cannot detox. That is precisely why I said that, like, you know, this whole process of chelation requires somebody who really knows what they're doing and that it cannot happen for the rest of your life. Because if you do that, then you are going to be losing a lot of nutrients and you can't do that. So that is really the point that I'm trying to make, that it's not a process that you can take lightly. It's an important process and it requires constant observation. It requires constant supervision. What do you think of the hair test to check mercury levels in the body? Uh, I don't use hair test. I don't think hair test is necessarily a very reliable test for metals. Uh, sometimes you could have a lot of stuff in the metal because that's one of the way your body is getting rid of it. And maybe you have nothing in your bloodstream. And if you check your porphyrins, the porphyrin is completely normal. So I would not use hair test as a test for metal toxicity. And I know a lot of people use those tests. And a lot of times when they have come in with their tests, the hair has this whole slew of things positive. Positive X metal and positive Y metal and positive Z metal. And when you do the porphyrin, it does not correlate. So my goal is not to get your hair cleaned with metals. My goal is that it should not be in your bloodstream, which is from where the, from the bloodstream it goes into the urine. So the two areas which I'm interested in not seeing any metals because that's going to have direct consequence to your health is going to be your bloodstream, which is the red blood cell, and your urine, because your urine is actually being made from the bloodstream. So that is what my goal is. Um, okay, so here's a, here's a more detailed question. 
I had all of my algum, algum remo fillings removed by a biological dentist, but was not provided any follow-up measures to deal with the mercury that was surely left in my body after decades. Any recommendation for things I should do? I am not having health issues. So if I'm it, not having health issues. Right. So it is not the it is not the function of the biologic dentist to get rid of the total body burden of mercury first of all so obviously they cannot give you anything because it's not really their job and uh, as we have said before that when you are doing the removal you have to have a functional physician and the other thing is that when you have when you were sent to a biologic dentist if you were sent to a biologic dentist by a functional physician and i'm sure that physician must have done some kind of testing to see what your baseline is and so you have to go back to the physician to see okay I have my total body burden, I have removed my mercury fillings. Now, what is the leftover burden? What process do I need to undertake? As far as not having any health issues or concerns, that's great that you don't have health issues. But a lot of times, just because you don't have health issues does not mean that the damage is not being done. So for example, like I told you about the person who had Alzheimer's, obviously she had mercury from, from a very long time ago. She had fillings when she was like 12 years old. And now she's coming to my office when she's 75. So she's having Alzheimer's issues. So what was happening was that the, the brain, as it's going to get older, the function of the brain is going to get compromised. Now, the issues which were not very evident will become evident, which means that now that damage that was being done slowly has become more pronounced. And now we are saying, oh, we have to remove this toxin because we want to kind of get more of the brain in a position to be able to function better. So whenever we have a chronic disease, we have to remember that the chronic disease does not start on the day we diagnose it. That chronic disease starts 10 years, 20 years, 30 years before that. So that is the whole idea of preventive medicine, that you don't go to a physician when you have a problem. You go to a physician 10, 15, 20 years before to make sure that you are not getting into trouble. So yes, you don't have problems right now because you're young. But over the course of time, as things will accumulate, your exposures are going to accumulate and you will start having problems. So why wait till that time? Go to your functional physician, whoever diagnosed you, and then you can go back, look at your baseline, see where you are and decide what's the best strategy for you to get rid of the total body burden and prevent further damage. Thank you. Does the practice of oil pulling impact the release of mercury from the algamum fillings? Of course. Uh, so when people do oil pulling, so first of all, we don't know what oil pulling is doing. To be honest with you, we don't have much data on oil pulling per se. A lot of people do it because they find it helps them. But remember that when you're going to do processes like oil pulling and stuff like that, and your mouth is full of mercury, of course, it's going to affect, there is a possibility that you may be putting out more mercury from those areas and putting it inside your body. Uh, because oil pulling, the practice of oil pulling dates a long time back. I mean, there, it used to be practiced by people many, many, many thousands of years ago. At that time, there was no concept of amalgam or silver filling in the mouth and all that. This is a new concept, which has just come in recently since we started putting the fillings. So you really have to be um, aware of the fact that if you have stuff in your mouth and you're going to do oil pulling, of course, you might be exposing yourself more to the problem. And that's why, you know, a lot of times when we, uh, when we see patients, you know, they have learned about a process from Google uh, and they feel like maybe we should do it. And the, the intention is perfect, but the outcome is not because there are a lot of nuances that you have to consider before you undertake a process. Because unfortunately, a medicine is much more complicated. Our exposures are much more than they were before. And so those things have to be taken into account. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish up with the last two questions. Um, if a single blood test shows normal mercury levels, are you in the clear or could you still have high mercury body, high body mercury burden despite the normal blood test? 
So that's an excellent question. So first of all, what is the blood test? Is the blood test being done in serum or plasma? Or is the blood test being done in the red cell? If the blood test is being done in the red cell, the, red, the life of a red cell is between 90 and 120 days. That means that exposure is either recent or the exposure is, being, is happening for a long time as things are slowly and gradually being trickled into the bloodstream. How to distinguish between the two? You will go ahead and do the urine porphyrin testing. So remember that that is why when we test, we never do one test, we do two tests. We do urine porphyrin, we do red cell because we want to understand what exactly is happening. Whether this is a recent exposure, this is a long-term exposure, what's happening in the urine. So both of those tests are done in order for us to get a better picture of what's going on. Uh, and if both of them are in clear, then you're fine. Then there is no issues. That means what the red blood cell is showing is also what the urine is showing. There's compatibility between the tests and you're clean and you don't have to worry about it. So the last question, I'm going to take two questions and put them together. And they both are on the same things. And it's, um, since mercury is still being used in so many products and medical items, what is the benefit of including or using it? And then the two that I'm lumping are, why are we still using it if we know that it's a neurotoxin and it's dangerous? Why are we putting that in our mouth? And how does, you know, what is the rationale behind the ADA continuing to allow it? So I think the second question I'll have Dr. Macero handle that. Uh, I'll answer the first one. Why is it being used in medicine? So um, a couple of things. First of all, remember that when we started using mercury thermometers and blood pressure monitoring machines, actually mercury is very accurate when it comes to, you know, looking at the temperature. That's why it's also used in barometers. It's really an amazing tool. But the problem is at the time we started using um, thermometers and blood pressure monitoring machines, we did not know it was toxic. After we found out there were guidelines which were sent to physicians and it was sent to all of the manufacturers that this is toxic and you should not use it. Now remember, you can give a guideline. It doesn't mean that the guideline is being implemented. So there are lots of thermometers which don't have mercury now that are available, but there are also those companies that are still producing the one with mercury. And so that is the dilemma that, you know, you can tell people what to do. I mean, you can take the horse to water, but you can't put water in the mouth of a horse. So, I mean, that's what we are doing. WHO has clearly stated it's uh, one of the most important toxins. We have a ton of data, but we can't force people to do the right thing. We can tell them. And that's why we are having the webinar that we can't, I can't stop the manufacturing companies to stop producing, but I can stop you from going and buying stuff that's going to harm you. And that's where we, unfortunately, with most of the environmental stuff. So I'll, I'll have Dr. Macero answer the ADA question. She is better equipped with that information. So I think the question is, why does the ADA still allow this? Is that right, Kathleen? Correct, correct. Um, so back in the 1800s, um, there were two groups of dentists, dentists that were anti-amalgam, anti-amalgam users and dentists that were pro-amalgam users. And unfortunately, the pro-amalgam users were the dentists who banded together and actually formed the ADA. So I don't know if in our lifetime or ever, if the ADA will ever go back on their stance on amalgam. Um, the ADA backs the dental schools. Um, they do do some good things for dentists. They unify dentists in, in legal things of, you know, uh, we have a voice in um, the medical world. But they, but they still, they still tell the public that um, there's no strong evidence that amalgams are unsafe. So um, when you come out of dental school, you will have a strong conviction that amalgams are okay to use. And that's hard to, you know, unless something happens to the dentist, like in my case, that people will change their mind or that the dentist will, will see things differently. Then amalgams are so ubiquitous. I mean, so many, many people have so many, many amalgams. Um, so it's, it's hard for them. It's like, well, why doesn't everybody get sick? You know, it, maybe everyone gets sick in different ways, but, you know, if mercury affects every organ system, then, <laughs> you know, then you're sick. Um, but 
the FDA, um, the FDA, let me see, I have that written down here, considers dental amalgam fillings safe for adults and children over the age of six. The FDA regulates dental amalgams as a medical device. Um, so legally, things can get hairy for the dentist if I turn around and say, you know, mercury is bad for you, amalgam fillings are bad, you should have your amalgams out. Dentists aren't allowed to say that. You can come in and request your amalgam fillings out, but I can't tell you to take your, that you should take your amalgam fillings out. Um, because legally, we can get in trouble with our boards because the ADA also backs our state legislator, our state boards, and malpractice carriers. And malpractice carriers can stop serving dentists, which you can't practice if you don't have malpractice insurance. Um, so it gets hairy for the dentist. So unfortunately, I don't, I hope this goes away, but I don't see it in the near future. I think the other issue is that as we have talked about the fact that there is um, what we call the toxin research is not as clear cut as we would like it to be. It's not necessarily going to correlate with, so if you have five people, so if you take, for example, you take 100 people, of them five people have a level over 90. Somebody has a level of 50, somebody has a level of over 10. Now you will see some people who have a level over 10 will have the same symptoms as the one who have over 90 as the level. So then you can argue that why is the case? And remember I said to you in the beginning that one of the properties of mercury is that even small exposure can be toxic in some people. And the reason is because it has to do with genetics. It has to do what is your ability to detox. If you have a poor ability to detox, then you can have two people with exactly the same level of mercury, one with symptoms and one without symptoms. That's number issue number one. The issue number two is that when somebody comes with toxicity symptoms, toxicity symptoms, they are not, they, even though they will have mercury, if you remember the slide I showed you, which showed the porphyrin levels of that one of the porphyrin I said was very specific for mercury, but the other two porphyrin levels are not just present in those with mercury, they're also present in those with arsenic and cadmium and organotoxins. So what's gonna happen is that the, the individual who's coming with symptoms of toxicity most more often than not will have more than one toxin that is causing the problem. So you cannot just say, oh, it was just mercury which caused the problem. It could be mercury, it could be arsenic, it could be cadmium. So which one of the three is it going to be? Now you, what you have done is, all this has to be proven by the poor person who's already having a disease instead of the company who is producing arsenic related items and um, cadmium associated stuff and mercury associated stuff. So the toxicity research that we used to have was on single toxins. That research is no longer helping us because we're not dealing with single toxins. We're dealing with multiple toxins. And that is why we are miserably failing not only to diagnose the issues, we are miserably failing in taking these manufacturers to task because they, they can easily turn around and say, oh, it's not mercury, it's some other toxin which we did not produce. So that is why it's so complicated and so convoluted. Thank you so much. And that concludes today's webinar. Thank you, Dr. Macero, so much for being a guest today and thank you as well, Dr. Nadia Ali, for all of the useful and wonderful information that you've provided. So I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of their weekend, and I'd like to thank you. Thank you.